It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. What a great beginning to a dystopian novel. Uh, it begins as seemingly an ordinary day, and then the clocks are striking 13. Something's wrong in this world. Um, the setup of 1984 um, is fine for a dystopian novel. You have multi-continental empires of Oceania, Eurasia, and East Asia. Uh, they are at war with each other or allies with each other. In the book, it says that Oceania has always been at war with Eurasia and has always been allies with East Asia, at least at the beginning of the novel. The protagonist, Winston Smith, works in the Ministry of Truth. His job is to edit texts so that they match the current truths. So not only is the party right now, the party has always been right. Its predictions have always been accurate. And so you simply go back and change the predictions to match what the party said has actually happened, which may also not be true, but at least is the current line. In the end, Big Brother and the party are always right. But there's one problem, one flaw in this system, one fly in the ointment for Winston Smith. He remembers. If only he couldn't remember what had been said the last week, the last month, years before, he would be fine. But the problem is he thinks and he remembers. Now Orwell's 1984 was published in 1948. And so 1984 was a long ways away. Uh, his Animal Farm had been written a few years earlier, published in 1945. And through Orwell's history, he had seen these empires shifting. So in 1936, the Spanish Civil War broke out. And actually, Orwell went, uh, I think, to cover it as a journalist for a time. Um, and there we saw the Soviet Union fighting against fascist Italy and Nazi Germany yet on the side of the monarchy, which is sort of an odd, uh, you know, the Republic. They were in, uh, supporting that side. But then in August of 1939, the Soviets made a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany against Poland and by implication against the United Kingdom and France that were on Poland's side. And after the Nazi invasion in September, the Soviet Union itself invaded Eastern Poland as the Nazis had taken Western Poland. So the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were now on the same side. And then in June of 1941, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union, making the USSR and the United Kingdom allies. Well, now it's on the other foot again. And they managed to defeat Nazi Germany with the Lend-Lease Act and cooperative and a unified campaign of unconditional surrender. But starting in 1945, hostilities between the USSR and the West resumed as the Soviets exerted what they called a sphere of influence over Eastern Europe, such that by March of 1946, Winston Churchill famously described an iron curtain between the East and the West. And it was the beginning of a Cold War. We are allies with the Soviet Union. We are enemies with Germany. We are allies with Germany. We are enemies of the Soviet Union. Sounds eerily familiar. Now, Orwell had also seen what had happened to truth, to individual freedom, even to family life under both fascism with the Nazis and communism um, under the Soviets. The party was always right. The individual who disagreed was wrong. And because the party promised the best world ever, it must be right. And whatever it does must be justified. And so he saw the show trials that had taken place in the Soviet Union in the 30s as Stalin purged the old guard and found ways to convince them to say they had done the most ridiculous acts of espionage and counter-revolution because the cause was just to implicate themselves, to deny themselves, to save the party, to save the revolution. When Winston Smith himself has been arrested 
and is imprisoned and ultimately tortured in what's called the Ministry of Love, his dopey neighbor Parsons also gets arrested. He's arrested for thought crime because of something he said in his sleep. And when Winston says to Parsons, do you really think you're guilty? Parsons' response is both beautiful and terrible. He says, of course I did it. You don't think the party would arrest an innocent man, do you? If I was arrested, I must be guilty because the party doesn't make mistakes. Once anything is infallible, the individual suffers. If the party is right and working for the best possible world, then any measures are justified. And that terrible quote offered by um, the interrogator is, if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stomping on a human face forever. Orwell's turns of phrase are really marvelous, and I find this novel held up fantastically well. Now, I didn't read it in 1948, obviously. Um, I read it when I was in high school, some 30 plus years ago. Very memorable, um, and I found rereading it now 30 years later that oh, I remembered a, a, quite a lot of it. I think I saw a movie version at one point, um, sometime in between, and uh, you know, other, other accounts of it, of course, the images come up, the language comes up quite a bit in Western culture. But um, I, I found it really a very memorable novel, even to the plot points and how it developed. Um, so that's a good, that's a sign of a good novel that it stuck with you uh, that well over all these years. And he creates these indelible images, the idea of a big brother poster whose eyes seem to follow you around the room. His wonderfully creative approach to language. You know, the slogans of the party, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And I especially love his, I love languages anyways, but I love his approach to new speak, even the concept of new speak, that there is a new language that is appropriate to the party and it will be fewer words year after year, unlike every other language, because the idea is don't even allow people to think. If they don't have a word for the concept, they can't even conceive of what it could be. Uh, the idea of a thought crime, that you can be uh, arrested, tortured, even killed for thinking the wrong thing. And the concept of uh, Big Brother is watching you, and so are the telescreens. Um, or we might say the Alexa, <laughs> the Amazon Echo, right? We have our devices watching us too. Um, we might think they're more benign, but you know, everyone has had that experience where they're having a conversation with someone about something and all of a sudden their email and their Facebook feed is flooded with ads about the subject they happened to mention in passing and some microphone somewhere picked it up and now it's connected to you and Big Brother or Big Zuckerberg knows what you're thinking. Um, and the indelible image of the eternal enemy. You know, it's not just Big Brother that we're supposed to love, it's Emmanuel Goldstein that we must hate, the brotherhood, the enemies. Uh, it's explicitly anti-Semitic, you know, um, not that Orwell is, but that uh, Oceania and its propaganda arms certainly are. Um, there's even a terrible scene seeing refugees getting destroyed and the audience is thrilled and he highlights that it's a Jewish woman that seems to be the one destroyed. Um, they are seen as the other. And the idea of hatred and hating the other is clearly an important part of the power and the, the scary power of the world created by, um, by Orwell in 1984. So I wanted to ask um, if you read 1984, and I believe uh, everyone on the call has, um, is there a particularly memorable scene or a phrase or a moment in the story that, that sticks with you when you think about 1984? I love the concept of doublethink. And so the exploration of doublethink, which is fairly early in the novel, I want to say it's in the first third, um, that to understand doublethink requires doublethink. Um, and I think doublethink has become endemic in, uh, in our society of the ability to hold two contradictory ideas um, as both, although completely incompatible, to hold them both as true. Um, and then to have a mental process where you forget that you're doing that. 
And in doing that, you do it again. Um, and the ability to switch on a dime. And to, it, yeah. it feels like our current political system uh, is phenomenally reliant on doublethink. And I will also confess this, I've read the book dozens of times. I, I, I don't know how many times I've taught this book or read this book, but when teaching it to younger people, I would skip the book. So the book really has three sections, right? It has all the way up until Julia and Winston in that attic, and then he gets the book. And then we get all of Orwell's political philosophy uh, which most of my readers would fall asleep to. It's very interesting, and for the purpose of our conversation, probably um, very important. And then we get back to the plot when you So I frequent, I've read that middle part far fewer times. Yeah. Well, it also gives you sort of the the fictional alternate history of what happened through what we would call the 20th century. You know, uh, it, it fills in the gaps of the world of Oceania, East Asia, and Eurasia, and how they got there. Um, so I find it useful just to get Orwell's mental context for how things turned from what we had in 1948 that he knew to what he envisioned happening in 1984. Um, that was very useful. But yes, it's, it is a little bit more heavy handed on the, the political side. Um, and, and yet it's fascinating when you realize who wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> it it wasn't written by Goldstein. There may not be a Goldstein, just like there may not be a Big Brother. Um, it, you know, it was written by the interrogator who um, wrote it, uh, perhaps talking the truth, perhaps telling what the you know um, the p person who longed to be in the Brotherhood would want to hear. Uh, we, we just it, what what makes the novel uh, fascinating to reread is when you realize that nothing that person said is believable. You know, the unreliable narrator, the unreliable rhetor uh, you know, rhetorician um, makes it very hard to get a fixed point. You know, you need a fixed point to be able to understand. And that's part of the point of the novel is that if we don't have a fixed objective point and everything is absolutely subjective, whatever the party says may go. Um, so. Uh, there's there's no real reliable no real facts facts are as mutable as as anything else yeah right. you can't have a hero without a villain yeah that's right that's right um, and we'll talk about whether you can have a group movement without an enemy uh, that's a part of the motivation too i don't know if you know they actually recently um published a novel in, this year called julia which is a retelling of the story from that character's perspective uh, I haven't had a chance to read that, uh, but I saw, I read an interview with the author and it was really fascinating. And she said it was actually tough for her because she was so immersed in the world of Stalinism in 1984 uh, that she'd have conversations with her husband and he'd be like, wait a minute, you're, you're, you're getting off the deep end into this totalitarian stuff. Um, so I'm curious, I know uh, Faye can't uh, talk, but maybe she can uh, type in the chat, um, or Ilya, if there's a particular scene or episode or, or language in the, um, in the novel that, uh, that struck you. Ilya, you're muted, I'm sorry. The basic uh, premise of the book was something uh, that resonated. I mean, I read uh, Animal Farm on the train as I was leaving Soviet Union. Uh, it was available because it was translated in Ukrainian and somehow the Ukrainian version uh, escaped uh, the, the censors. Uh, of course, the books were censored. And uh, it was in some nowhere, like a little uh, town where I picked it up because there was a train stop there. And for some reason, I wound up uh, uh, noticing the book and I got it. Um, what was interesting to me is, I mean, he seemed to have, in the book, it's much more about uh, Stalinism style dictatorship as opposed to uh, Nazi style dictatorship. Uh, at least that's my perception. And uh, the other thing, again, it's been a while since I read the book. Uh, so I'm going by recollections of, of things that are uh, important. Uh, the the Ministry of Truth to me was 
something that as long as somebody says, I know the truth and uh, uh, I'm entitled to enforce my truth, uh, basically you wind up with Ministry of Truth. Uh, the one point where the DHS was going to, ha uh, to have uh, a uh, kind of like Ministry of Truth, they were going to have a committee that was going to figure out what's true, what's not true. And uh, I think that uh, thanks to 1984 book, that idea kind of died. Um, the, the concept of hating the enemy, um, I think that we're getting in some circles in U.S. to appreciating it, but I grew up with it. Uh, hate was normal. It was accepted. Just like, uh, you know, I mean, we didn't necessarily have, uh, what was it, the hate moment, uh, hate hour, whatever the hell it hate, was. Hate called. week, three minute, yeah. Three hate week. Week. A three minute hate and then the hate week. They were the hate. Right. We didn't have it, but it was built into the society. And it was kind of understood that that's the normal thing. Um, I find that, uh, I mean, not here, not there. I'm thinking about, the, there was a guy who I used to watch quite a lot, uh, Charlie Rose on uh, PBS. And then there was, uh, it came out that he did uh, the wrong things. He, he had uh, whatever the hell he had in his head uh, that made him uh, want to stand uh, naked in front of women, which was clearly a, a problem. But suddenly <laughs> his name disappeared from the history of PBS. While he was probably one of the most uh, important, while he was there, I mean, he probably was the most visible and important. Uh, so he was basically erased. And it kind of made me think of Ministry of Truth, where somebody gets erased. Yeah, I mean, this is an ongoing debate over this phrase, cancel culture, and, you know, that people get canceled for things. Um, is it erasure from... Uh, uh, from society, well, the, the challenge is that you're always Googleable. You know that that never goes away. In fact, um, one of the problems is if you ever get uh, busted for something like this or, or become the object of a popular, um, uh, whether it's a witch hunt or a justifiable, you know, uh, mob action, whatever, um, you can't recover because that's forever. Um, it's, and, and it's, it, yes, you can and you cannot. I mean, I'm thinking of, uh, what's his name, Mel Gibson. Uh, he was as close to being erased as they come, but somehow maybe it's enough money and uh, enough pool. But, uh, to, you know, it's it, it, so this is where it's tricky. There, there was a woman um, maybe 20 years ago whose name was Justine Sacco. You may never have heard of her. No. Nope. But... She became sort of a poster child for this online mob mentality. Um, she was getting on a flight in London, flying to South Africa for a conference. And she made some kind of glib offhand comment to say, um, I'm off to South Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. And then turned off her phone and got on the plane. And then everyone started piling on what a terrible person she is, how dare she. By the time she landed, she was out of a job. and. Ever since then, it's been impossible for her to restart her life because anyone she wants to date, anyone that she, any job that she applies for, does a Google search of her, and the first thing that pops up is Justine Sacco is such a terrible person. So on one hand, there's the sort of social death, the shunning, and part of the uh, the thesis behind people that have studied this phenomenon is it's like the the witch hunt that makes you feel better about yourself. You know, if I have someone that I can say that person's bad, the implication is I'm good because I'm condemning the bad person. And so that's why we get this pile on mentality um, where everyone condemns the one person because that makes them feel better about themselves. There was a beautiful image of this. There was a, an excerpt from a book about Justine Sacco in the New York Times Magazine, and they had a picture of all these like Twitter birds all pointed at one bird in the middle. And it was, you know, everybody aiming at the one, uh, one person. Um, so, is Justine Sacco canceled? Well, she's infamous, 
right? She can't get away from what she's blamed for, but there's also no way for her to, um, you know, recover fully to what she was before. Um, and, and this isn't a government organized thing. This is the mob, you know, doing its thing. Um, and some people make a distinction between what individuals choose to do or what society will do versus a government imposing it with the force of law and the force of arms, the force of, you know, uh, the, the deployment of um, force and even uh, death up to a point. So, um, but I, I absolutely hear what you're saying also about the distinctions between the Soviet Union style of totalitarianism and the, uh, the fascist style. Although, you know, the cult of personality, the use of propaganda, that, that's also very much a part of the Nazi uh, world. Um, the, the particular ideology as expressed in Ingsoc, which is short for English socialism, is a collectivist approach. But after all, there was just as much rationing and control of private behavior and false reports of pr productivity and so on in, in uh, Nazi Germany as there was in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, Faye commented in the chat that she reread this during the last administration, and it was scary how much was happening in real life. Um, and this is a case where I find um, Orwell was a genius because you can read 1984 as someone who is liberal and talk about how evil the other people are, but you can also read it as someone who's conservative and who sees how evil the progressive people are. If you talk about Newspeak, for example, you know, using new languages, new concepts, having, uh, having to believe something you just know isn't true. Look at the arguments that are happening over uh, transgender individuals and the idea of the gender binary and requiring people to be registered by their birth gender as opposed to their identity. Um, and so, for, from the conservative perspective, this is new. This is new speak. I'm, I'm committing a thought crime by using the wrong pronouns. You know, you're changing the language from your ideology. So you can you can take the examples of the totalitarian excess, and you can apply it to your enemy from either side. Um, and so that that's what makes the insight into the risk of government power of groupthink of um, eliminating the individual freedom for the sake of the collective ideology um, and use it to critique uh, multiple political approaches. David, were you going to jump in? I, I, I don't know if I, what I'm going to say is still relevant. Um, the concept of Newspeak, of Big Brother, of Erasure, um, have taken on a different form in the internet age. And I think that's what you were saying, Adam, and to a certain yeah. degree, Ilya as well, where we don't need Big Brother to, to watch us. We're watching each other all the time. I, I often suggest walk down the street, any street, anywhere, and count the number of security cameras that are watching you at that any particular moment. Um, you referenced the, and, and I did read an article recently, your phone or whatever it is, is not listening to you when you say that. It's far more insidious. Um, in terms of the connection, my phone knows it's been in proximity with your phone, and yeah. the way this works is really it, it, it's clever, but clever, scary um, in the way that we've taken these concepts and basically turned them on for ourselves. Um, but I also want to flip the the script, if you will, because um, Orwell's French teacher wrote a different book a few years ahead of him. Um, and it's the one that we often look at when we say the flip side, the two coin, <laughs> the two sides of the coin is Orwell says, uh, we're going to do thought crime. We're going to we're restrict what you can read. And Huxley says, you're not going to want to read. You're not going to want to think. We're going to create a society where, you know what? No one's feeling oppressed. No one's feeling terrible. No boot is kicking a face, but no one really wants to yeah. do any of that. Drug it up with Soma and that's all you need. <laughs> have a little sex, go to the feelies. Um, yes. So I, I think that we've taken these two two very different, almost opposition dystopic concepts, and we found a way to make them all work here in our society. Yeah. Well, you know, this is the genius of the, the great science fiction writer who sees what's happening now and 
projects it into the future, sees the trend, you know, and, and projects it out in that direction. Um, the book that we talked about last night, Earth Abides, yeah. um, 1984 was published, I believe, in 1959, as oh, was, was uh, okay. 1949. I'm sorry, 1949. Yeah, yeah he, he wrote it, and that's how he gets, he wrote it in, in 48, and I think it's published in 49, and so was Earth Abides. And we, we had a little bit of fun with sort of the two, these two dystopic, two apocalyptic to a certain degree books um, with such, at the same time, by British authors, um, very different concepts. But there is no question that 1984 lives. Yeah. One interesting side of this is his critique of secularism. Because it's very explicit in the novel that the dominant ideology is no God, no supernatural, no religion. You know, they can't even remember the rhymes about the churches and the, nobody goes to the churches because nobody does religion anymore. Or at most, the proles do something, but who cares about the proles? Um, and it seemed to me that part of his um, critique of that it's not that he's necessarily, you know, a, a, a deep God believer who thinks that's the ultimate ontological reality, but that it's an it's an ex, it's an example of the lack of personal belief, the lack of personal uh, freedom to think and to uh, make up your own mind. And what happens when you don't have that kind of freedom and you don't have a religious expression, community of ideology, whatever, the politics becomes the religion. And if you see how fervently people are holding on to their political identities, even as American society has gotten more and more secular with a larger proportion of people who don't go to church, who aren't members of religious organizations, who identify as no particular religion, uh, but the, the political fanaticism is just as strong as, you know, in an inquisition period. Um, the, the politics takes on a character like religion, where you have your saints and you have your devils you have your heresies and your heretics, you have your inquisition. You know, look what's happening right now with the, the Republicans in the House of Representatives where they choose someone who could be possibly speaker and then uh, Trump comes out and says he's a rhino, which is like he's a heretic, he's a counter-revolutionary, you know? It's, it's, uh, and then they, then they have to burn the witch because that's, that's what you do. Uh, you can't accept him. Uh, he has now been outed as a heretic. Um, so. Uh, the, the fervor of our current politics is actually so, to some degree a function of the secularization of our society. And we who've been secular for a long time are disappointed <laughs> because we thought, oh, once people get more secular, they'll be all rational and reasonable and we can have, you know, um, uh, reasonable discussions. Uh, but it, it isn't always the way it turns out. Um, so I, I found that an interesting angle that I hadn't recognized in the story the first time I read it. Uh, but I definitely saw it reading at this time and thinking about the dynamics of politics as religion today. Um, one thought that crossed my mind is that we we seem to be approaching, at least uh, in many situations. When I came to America, the idea was that whether people agree with you or disagree with you, you could express your opinions and that was okay. Even if they don't, didn't agree with you or if you didn't agree with them. Um, I would say over the last let's say five years, maybe 10 years, but probably like five years, that, that became a, it's not, a, not acceptable, which is to say that uh, certain opinions are just verboten. And uh, particularly in academia, a friend of mine teaches, uh, and he teaches because he likes to teach. It's, it's not like a, you know, uh, he needs to make a living. And he finds himself, he says that, once in a while, he will bring up some subject uh, about this or that, what have you. And it's, it's basically not acceptable. Now, if he was a, a career academician, what is it, 98% more or less sign up the same way in the US. But what I'm finding is that we've gotten to be in a situation where uh, the, the middle of the road, the liberal with a little L uh, view of uh, capitalism and society and what have you, uh, not only is it 
not to be discussed. It's not to be thought of. And uh, it might be that uh, we are approaching a situation where uh, things might start changing uh, literally within the last months. Uh, but I wouldn't bet on it because the trend's been in one direction. And it's like in Soviet Union, when you grew up, you knew that you, you can't talk to anybody. The only people you could talk to were your family and close friends. And that was it. And that's what you see in, uh, in 1984. Right. And I think that for, for probably not better, but U.S. has been drifting in that direction. Uh, and uh, particularly if you are not with the easily digestible liberal orthodoxy. Uh, well, but it depends on, but it, Ilya, it really depends on where you are and who you're talking to. So there is a bizarro world, Facebook world out there that I don't experience, that is all Trump all the time, that is all Christian nationalism. Um, and for them, a lot of the things that I would say would be just as anathema, I would be just as canceled there. And more importantly, I think that we sometimes idealize this era of free speech in America that's now been ended. Because if you went back to the 50s, you would absolutely be canceled for anything left of the Democratic Party. You know, people's jobs were destroyed. Their lives were destroyed by accusations of having once been part of the Communist Party. Um, if you go back into the 1850s, you know, if you were an abolitionist, you could get run out of town on a rail or lynch uh, and, and vice versa. Look at bleeding Kansas. I mean, you know, the idea that there was this idealized period of liberal, you know, uh, parlor conversation where everybody could say everything at any time. You know, I, would I, don't, say that I don't know when that would have been in American history. My impression was that uh, in the 80s and 90s, that was kind of like, I mean, uh, you had much more of a discussed things. People felt freer to discuss. There were also arguably the number of people on the fringes seemed to have been either they were not as vocal or there was not as many of them. And it's I, think that, I think that every age, 80s and 90s, I'm thinking about the 80s and 90s, have their taboo subjects um, and have their subjects, um, 80s and 90s, especially let's talk about AIDS mm -hmm. um, and have their areas that, we, and I think that, you know, we talk about free speech, we talk about, you can say anything, but the limits are here or there. There are always limits. There are limits and consequences. You cannot walk into a theater and yell fire. Um, and you can't stand on the street corner um, and and shout hateful epithets um, at the people passing by. Um, so the the extent. So the second one, my understanding is technically you can. Um, <laughs> excitement is not right. Really so one of the one of the dilemmas we have on the free speech front. I do want to bring it back to 1984, not just a general bitch session. Um, <laughs> one, of the dilemmas, one of the dilemmas we have today is whether speech is violence. Yep. That is, if you say something that hurts someone else, their feeling, their sense of identity, uh, their sense of well-being in the world, um, does that count as uh, violence and therefore it's something that's preventable or actionable? Um, where you know, the old saying, uh, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me, um, is not the ethos that we live in today. Uh, because we understand this concept of microaggressions, of cumulative psychological load, of incitement, you know, um, be because if you, uh, you want to insult Jewish people on the street, um, in theory, it's your free speech. Um, if you do it in a context that's going to cause a riot, then you've, you've led to public disorder and then it can be a, a, a problem. Um, so, uh, in, in the world though, uh, of 1984, it's this idea of, uh, the power of hate, the power of saying the things and getting people to say the things and get their emotions out in this channeled way. Um, you know, in theory, people who are experiencing this world that Winston's describing where they can't get razors and they can't get chocolate and they lower the chocolate ration and they celebrate the new chocolate ration because it's so great because they've forgotten what the old chocolate ration was. Um, all that emotion is directed toward hating your enemies 
and loving only Big Brother. Part of it actually reminded me of the Bible, where God is a jealous God, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might for when you rise up to when you go to, I mean, you could just put in Big Brother in place of God, and that's what it's describing in the novel. Um, but it's that two-sided coin of the hate and the love. I love my group, I love my people, I hate those people. And again, you see it on both sides of the, the political aisle. Um, another wonderful book that, that bears rereading, which I think I talked about a couple years ago, is Eric Hoffer's The True Believer, which he wrote in the 1950s. But he made a similar point that the extreme of the political left and the extreme of the political right actually have more in common with each other than the moderate liberal in the middle who can see both sides of an issue. The absolutist is an absolutist in either direction. Um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, we each have our, our uh, groups that we hate, Both whether or not we have a, a, hate, re a hate week, but um, that, that uh, facilitates the group think, but also the exclusion of the other opinion that Elia was talking about. Yeah, I think that the, the, the line uh, that uh, you start from the center and if you go far enough on the left and a little bit further, you're on the right and vice versa. Uh, that uh, the, the extreme spectrum becomes very hard to tell one from another uh, in practical terms because it becomes dictatorship. And on the dictator, it's, uh, it, I mean, there's no such thing as private property anymore because the dictator owns everything. So then it's, so uh, you call the dictator, you, you call the government, whatever. Talking about free speech, the, the famous joke in the, in Soviet Union in America is that uh, an American says, uh, we have free speech. I can say anything I want about the president and there is no problem. And the Soviet guy says, no problem here either. I can say anything about your president I want. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, Faye mentioned, yeah, I can't have it here, which is actually 1935, um, which does have a very 1984 feel to it. You're absolutely right. Um, and a precursor to um, 1984. Um, but I say, uh, just to hang on one second. Yeah, uh, Brave New World is 1931. Um, in terms of these sort of books that have a political bent, because there's certainly, um, we have uh, you know a number of different writers, most, um, so we have uh, British writers and American writers doing this. I, I misspoke before. George um, Stewart is American, not British. But uh, I'm thinking about, and I'm blanking right now, so I'm going to be quiet. So. Okay. One thing that occurs to me is 75 years, and you could say that we're approaching, I mean, if you think about China today, they certainly seem to be marching in the direction of... Uh, uh, well, it's not Big Brother, it's Xi Jinping. Uh, it's been in power now for, what, 11 years? And uh, he's got to be, what, about 69? So he can easily be in power another 15 years. Uh, I think that if there is a scale on which uh, 1994 represents, uh, say, 10, uh, and arguably, let's say, China is today five, I can see a progression uh, from five to 10. Oh, sure. And also, you know, the control of information, uh, the, the limits on what people can know and explore. Um, not as many limits on travel, as far as I understand. You know, that's one of the, one of the aspects of this world of Oceania is how, how easy it is to be racist against the other uh, empires because there's no mixing, there's no interaction uh, in that way. And I, I don't think China is, as, uh, is not a seal. It's not like North Korea, right? North Korea might be like a nine on that uh, 1984 scale, um, but it's, it's, it's very hard to, to maintain that. So let's talk about two plus two equals five. Uh, this is again, one of those indelible, you know, um, images, uh, language pieces that stick with you out of the novel. The idea that the party can tell you that two plus two equals five and you have to say yes. Um, it's double think for sure. It's uh, submission to authority. Um, but 
It's also, I would argue, um, the danger of absolute faith in any party, in any source of truth that doesn't engage your own rational mind to make choices. Um, that uh, if, if the consensus is this, then you must agree with it. Well, that's a problem. Uh, it's one of the reasons why in one of our high holiday sermons this last year, I asked people, what are your heresies? Where are the places where, where you will not agree with the people you normally agree with? Uh, and you, we should each have one. I mean, it's, it's a good you know, life skill to learn how to disagree with the consensus. Um, you know, uh, you, you watch what happens, by the way, with um, uh, what hap uh, with uh, Donald Trump's political communications and how he will just flat out deny what he said was true several months before. And he's relying on people either not checking him or not caring or accepting the fact he's going to lie anyways, and I'll believe what he's saying now. Um, but the, the, the question of hypocrisy, this question of gaslighting, uh, you know, I've never had uh, Jenna uh, Ellis as my attorney. Uh, Jenna Ellis was my best attorney. Like, you know, it, it, the next day uh, produces a different answer. Um, but if you believe that your side is all correct and the other side is all wrong, look, there are 30 people in the House of Representatives right now who could walk across the aisle and talk to the Democratic Party and work out some kind of power sharing arrangement of the Sanity Caucus. And they, they cannot do it because the other side is East Asia, is Eurasia, uh, and, they, and they will not go against Big Brother, um, who deep six Tom Emmer's nomination to become speaker just yesterday with one true social message. Um, and they won't uh, go outside the bounds of the party. The party defines the permissible and, uh, and they won't go beyond that. And one could argue these days that uh, with Trump, the party has gotten to be a different party. That what uh, the party used to mean before 2015, 16 uh, had changed. And probably a lot of constituents changed, but also the rules are set up that uh, you, you I mean, as backwards, believe it or not, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Beth Orr. Uh, was Oler bringing in all those members, right? I don't know if you remember, uh, for the final election. Uh, and suddenly it was a different uh, electorate. And uh, so it's, uh, the, the other thing, it kind of makes you wonder how do these parliamentary uh, countries manage to have coalitions all day long with people who hate each other because so, so often they have no uh, one party in the majority. And in US you have this concept that if your party is two seats ahead of your opponent, that somehow the party will be functioning as a, as a unit as opposed to as 20 sub parties. Yeah, well, and, and it used to be the case that there, there was more flexibility. There were moderate Republicans from the Northeast. There were conservative Democrats. Okay from the South and you would make these coalitions sort of across the party lines. Um, but that's that's really gone by the wayside with the realignment in the last 50 years. And, and I will point out some parliaments don't do so well either. You know, <laughs> Belgium has been in a hung parliament for a long time. They can't get a coalition. Israel's went to elections, you know, six Italy times in five have, years or whatever. Italy used to have elections. 1980, in 1984, uses a very stratified class system. Yes which we could sort of look at today's world and say, you do have an inner party and an outer party and the proles. Um, and they see the proles as both the workhorses and the undergirding and as highly manipulatable and stupid. Like we can create, there's a whole section of the Ministry of Information that just, Ministry of Truth rather, that just, um, basically tries to give them what they want, keep them pacified, and they'll do whatever you say. Right. Bread, because circuses, music, and porn. Like that's, that's what they have this do. huge group of outer party people who think they are, they're really involved and who think 
they're very fervent and, and all the rest, but they are also really having their strings pulled by that very powerful and very small inner part. Yeah. You know, I was wondering uh, who are the proles today? And uh, Winston is confident that if there's hope, it lies in the proles. But I mean, maybe I'm a mid party level and, uh, person, and that's why I don't trust the proles right now. But, uh, you know, the proles, I mean, the proles are the Trumpers, you know? Um, okay, right now, uh, that's the case. Now, with on the other side, it's harder to say uh, the same thing, but it used to be before Trump, uh, there was no such defined, definable group. And Trump, what's that? Uh, ignorance is strength. I think that's one of his slogans. <laughs> it's, it's one of 1984 people. slogans. I don't know if Trump has used it yet. <laughs> well, my point is that it's de facto his slogan is basically is like, all you need to know is what I say. I don't need to worry about anything else. So ignorance is strength. Which right. brings us back to, you had talked about secularism. I think the world of 1984 is explicitly secular because we do not want any competition with the governmental deification. Well, it's, one could argue that that is the case for essentially all dictatorships. Yes, uh, absolutely. A, a, a divine right yes. simply got passed from the kings to the dictators. Um, and it is heretical to say that Trump is anything other than what he says he is. I mean, Putin, in theory, now is a very religious person, but somehow he makes sure that the head of the church is, uh, you know, treats him like God. Uh, my suspicion is uh, that if that wasn't the case, there would have been a different head of the church. Bye, Faye. Thanks for being here. Yeah, good Bye, to see Faye. you. Glad it worked out. And th this was the dream of the lunch and learn, right? She's down at, uh, you know, Orchestra Hall <laughs> uh, downtown, and she can uh, zoom in for the uh, the program. Yep. There are flaws in 1984. You know, nothing is perfect. No novel is perfect. Um, I think the love story between Winston and Julia is rather thin. I mean, is it is it even even really love between the two of them? It's the attraction of rebellion. To some extent, it feels like two 15 year olds who've managed to sneak off in the woods and they they because they have the opportunity, they they feel like it's love, but they don't really they, even have the capacity to understand what love is. They say right from the beginning that they're doomed. Right. We're already, we're already dead. Right. They, the rebellion is to a degree self-destructive, even one could say suicidal. Yep. Yeah. And and there are parts of the the instant flip that I mean maybe I'm naive, but just seem to, to me implausible. The, the one scene that I remember is where all of a sudden it's announced that the war is switched and we're fighting the other one. I think it was from Eurasia to East Asia or whatever. And then they look around themselves and say, spies have put up all these posters. And <laughs> you know, it's, how did this happen? This is a disaster. I mean, I know that he's, he's exaggerating on the point of the double think and being able to, to do whatever the party wants you to think. Um, but that, that sort of strained credulity to me that you could switch things that fast. You know, if Trump came out and said, China is our best ally when it comes to economic development. I, I don't know that he could get away with that. A Stalin could. Stalin well, could say anything because you cannot disagree. Because the right. moment you disagree, there is this friendly bunk in, uh, in Gulag waiting for you. Right. So he, he doesn't necessarily need to do it, although he needed labor, so he kept shipping people there. But uh, you censor yourself instantly, and you know that uh, the only uh, the only time you can express thoughts uh, that are not politically approved is uh, to your friends and family. Otherwise, you just don't talk. It's not well, like that really. That's really the point of the surveillance state in 1984. You can't even express them to your friends and family. They've trained your children to turn you in. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the cancel culture that we referred to e earlier is really just a, an arm of that same um, 
stick that we're that you're going to be hit with if you tr stray from orthodoxy. I love those little videos that have the, the picture of Trump's mugshot that say "Never Surrender," and the the reporter says, "You do realize that's a picture of him surrendering." <laughs> That he surrendered in the court. That's what that. That's what the whole. That's called surrendering for an um, indictment, and it. But it says never surrender. But he surrendered. We're Let's we're there. Something we're there. Me, the people who are really into Trump are not really into a 1984 book. <laughs> I don't think they're really into reading. Uh, well, they read, they read some things. I think you know, the, the, I'm sorry. The, reading the conspiracy theory is something that uh, seem to be common. And so there are lots of conspiracy theories to read and to debate and to discuss. And so I think that's where. And again, this is the genius of 1984. I have a couple of Facebook friends that I keep around because they're sort of, um, I, I would consider off the deep end. Um, and they are absolutely convinced that the most corrupt president in history is Joe Biden because he has taken money from Ukraine, he has taken money from China. Um, it was just laundered through uh, Hunter. It was really uh, Joe Biden who was the mastermind all the time. Um, you know, every everything they're finding of these transactions is just more proof that uh, he's, he's on the take and corrupt. And they don't see any problem with what Jared uh, Kushner did and his sovereign wealth fund investment from the Saudis or what uh, Ivanka Trump did, like they, they just don't see any problem with it because, and, and the flip side is, you know, uh, Joe, uh, Jake Tapper, who's a journalist on CNN has actually pursued some of the Joe Biden stuff and has highlighted some issues that are problematic, but MSNBC wants nothing to do with the story. And to give you just one last data point on the power of hate, they did a, a study of who was the most prominently figured politician on different news channels. And it turns out that on MSNBC, the number one um, profiled or um, uh, news stories about the polit political figure is Donald Trump. Well, uh, well, and on Fox, the number one is Joe Biden. <laughs> and number two is Hunter Biden. So it's, it's the enemy. We need the enemy, um, whoever the enemy happens to be. Right. My problem fundamentally with uh, coverage of Trump is that he's effectively being built up by left media uh, as opposed to being ignored. And uh, I would like to see him, to see him uh, basically ignored. But well, Fox has ignored him and it hasn't changed his approval rating. <laughs> right. Uh, so, you know, it could be that indeed we're going into a a bad place. And we, always, we always need a manual. The good, the good news being that the worst thing that can happen is four more years, either one, uh, and then there's not going to be another one. So the, the next generation is coming by hook or by crook, if not in uh, 2024, then in 2028. Uh, and so hopefully that creates a chance for more of a yeah, I, I can't imagine Chuck Grassley is going to run for president. The next generation is always my favorite. <laughs> well, it's like the your, 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 the favorite player on the football team is the backup quarterback. Because <laughs> he is the vessel for your hopes and dreams. <laughs> this is the year of the backup to the backup of quarterback, right? Right, right. All right, well, so I hope you, I hope you enjoyed this uh, dive into 1984. It obviously opens up a lot of contemporary political issues as well. Um, but it definitely, uh, it's, it's worth the reread because uh, the, the world building he does is scarily plausible, even today. Um, many aspects are very prescient. You know, the, the view screens that are always watching is, you know, something that television was just starting back then. And he, he saw so much uh, further forward uh, of it. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I think that, uh, uh, even even our use of Wikipedia has an aspect of 1984 because it gets edited and it's changing all the time and it reflects a social consensus, but it defines truth. And, you know, I'm, I'm finding now uh, working with younger students that uh, their number one look for truth is Google. And Google is only a function of whatever people have put up there 
Um, it's not it's not the kind of uh, verifiable truth that we would like to see. And so one thing I've worked with with my kids is what's your source? How do you know this? Is this just somebody talking on YouTube? Are they reliable? How do you know that? So the learning how to think about it, especially in an era of AI and chat GPT and all that creative stuff, how do you know it's true is a basic question. And if you can use your mind and say two plus two must equal four, um, then you can resist the social pressure to say two plus two equals five. Author and authority. <laughs> right. I also just throw one more thing in. 1984 is, is, is such a cultural monolith. It's, it's so powerful. I strongly recommend if you haven't read Cory Doctorow's Little Brother, um, which is obviously a, a direct discussion, but it, it it uses a 9-11 style event um, to amass where are the limits of personal freedom, where, where, what could the Department of Homeland Security do, and how might a group fight against. So Little Brother is used to defeat Big Brother um, in San Francisco. And, and it's fun. And Doctor, if you haven't read Doctor, he's, he's a must. But... His little brother is a great sort of let's talk about this in a post 9-11 world. Great. So you got little brother, you've got Julia, the 1984 uh, universe was done. Well, and don't forget Brave New World. If you haven't looked at Brave New World, I, I think Brave New World is more like us than 1984 is like us right now. Maybe that's, maybe that's the next reread.